Welcome back to Trying to Figure It Out, a podcast that I started almost exactly a year ago. I'm so excited to be here putting out more episodes for you guys here on Trying to Figure It Out. We do exactly that. We talk about pretty much everything under the sun from relationships, friendships, mental health, family dynamics, and so much more. And on today's episode, I'm very excited to announce that we're going to be talking about women's health with a world-renowned OBGYN physician. She practices here in LA at Cedars-Sinai and has delivered babies for royal families and celebrities like the Kardashians, Halsey, and Chrissy Teigen. Dr. Ali Abadi, welcome to Trying to Figure It Out. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so, so ex- excited that you're here. <laughs> Just talking to you about such important topics and topics that we're learning so much about as the world changes. I think this is such a good time to have someone like you on to give insight onto a lot of women's health issues that not many people know about, not many people recognize or talk about. We're just getting to a place now where insurance is covering things that it never did before. And so I think there's no better time to have you here. So I'm super excited. I'm excited to be here. (laughs) So before we get into anything, we almost had to push today's recording because you had to deliver a baby. And I just think that that's crazy because it's a Sunday and I'm like, Doctors literally have no time off, but especially a doctor like you where you don't get to decide when it's time to deliver a baby. (laughs) I actually went to the hospital. We have really good nurses too. I'm like, guys, I think she's going to deliver around four to five. What do you think? So one nurse said five. The other one said like 3.30. I'm like, okay, perfect. So I'm safe at noon. I'm going. (laughs) That's amazing. Well, is this pretty typical for you on a weekend? Oh my God. Yes. All the time. You know, it's not even delivery. Sometimes I was in the office yesterday. Saturday seeing my post-op patient it's always something yeah you know someone's going out of town they need to be seen Mm -hmm. so but I love it I kind of want to start by going back to your childhood and how you got to where you are now so you grew up in Iran and the Iranian revolution began when you were seven years old what did your life look like before and after the war so I had the best life in Iran I grew up in a very educated and well-off family. I had a village of family members, my grandparents. You know, I grew up with my family in the most beautiful country. I had it all. And overnight, uh, you know, our country went upside down when the Ayatollahs showed up. And so did my life. You know, we went from having nannies and housekeepers and drivers to not having anyone. Uh, from going on these fancy trips to not having money because they froze my dad's bank account. Uh, They took his passport away. So they took all of our passports away. So we all got stuck. And um, it was a scary time. Every single friend of my dad got um, killed or was placed in jail. He was the only one that I can think of who survived. You know, even though he had a relationship with the Shah of Iran, he was a banker, he owned multiple banks, but because he was the only person who didn't take money out of Iran, he could, you know, somehow they left him alone, but they took his passport away. So we couldn't leave the country until I was 17. And then the war started and, you know, it was awful. It was probably the lowest point of my life, you know, growing up in bombardments and, sleeping in the shelter, you know, we made our, we turned our basement into a shelter and we lived there. Literally, I would go to school and come and go down there because they would drop bombs. And if you were around windows like yours, they would just explode. And it was awful. It was a scary, scary childhood. (laughs) I can't imagine. That's terrible. I'm sorry that you had to go through that. So Amidst all of that and everything that was going on during that time, how did you know and did you know that you wanted to be an OBGYN? Oh, God, no. I had no (laughs) idea. Are you kidding? It was survival mode. It's go to school and not get killed by a bomb coming on your head. Right. That's how I grew up. And at 17, when my finally, after 10 years, my dad got his passport and we were able to leave. French was my second language after Farsi. So Mm -hmm. we went to France and we were going to go to medical school, my sister and I there. And then uh, that same year, our green card got approved. You know, we were in line for 10 years. And that summer, they called us. So we came to America. We literally stepped foot out of that plane. We looked around. My sister looked at me. She's like, I'm not going back anywhere. I want to stay in this country. We didn't speak the language, but we just stayed. And that was the new chapter. You know, when you grow up in a country that especially as a child, when you have no freedom, you know, these ayatollahs, I went from my mom wearing mini skirt to covering our 
uh, wearing a scarf going to school. Right. We had no women's right, freedom, out the door, uh, war, bombardments. You learn a new appreciation yeah. for life, Absolutely. you know, which you know, I've been here now in this country since I was, I don't know, 17. I'm 52 now. But I still get surprised how Americans don't have that gratitude that I have. Yeah. So no, I didn't know I was going to be a doctor. But you you have this appreciation for freedom, for basics of human rights. So when right. I came here, it was, I was like a kid in a candy store. Yeah. You know, and I couldn't understand why Americans did not appreciate what they had. Yeah, absolutely. Or what they have. How long did it take you once you moved here to be able to speak the language and to immerse yourself into American culture more? I took every single ESL class that was offered at my high school. Right. I came in as a senior in high school. It was awful. They put me in class. I couldn't understand a word of what these people were saying. Right. But, you know, when you know French, you learn English a little bit faster. And when you're Absolutely. 17, your brain is like a sponge. And yeah. third language is always easier, mm -hmm. you know. So I learned it. At six months, I was communicating. I was a hard worker. I had nothing else to do. So all I did was study. Yeah. And I did pretty well. I transferred to a junior college, obviously, because I had not applied. I, I would not never be able to take the SAT. Right. But uh, I went to junior college, was straight a straight A student at junior college and then transferred to UC Berkeley. I don't know how I got in. I think one <laughs> of the questions they asked is, why do you want to come to Berkeley? I vividly remember saying, I like Berkeley. That was my answer. <laughs> I didn't have a college counselor. I didn't know what I was doing. There was not one person to yeah. hold my hand and say, this is how you fill out an application. I don't even know why they took me. But I got in and I graduated on top of my class from Berkeley. And um, then I went to, I got my master's at Georgetown, went into medical school. But it goes back to that appreciation of what I was gifted suddenly. I went right. from not having anything in life to having everything, yeah. you know. Opportunity and freedom. Oh my God, freedom. yes. And does your family, all your family is still in California? My dad passed away, yes, but my mom's here, my sister's here. They're all rock stars. That's I come amazing. from a lineage of very strong, educated women, extremely so strong. Even in Iran after the revolution when we lost everything mm -hmm. and my dad, you know, had no more money, my mom started a clothing factory. In four years, she became the gap of Iran. So every kid That's that amazing. went to school was wearing her stuff. So... You know, when no woman was working and everyone was hiding at home, my mom was printing money in Iran during the revolution. That's amazing. So, you know, I also have that DNA in me. Yeah. You don't go down easy. For sure. <laughs> so I read an article about you while I was prepping for this interview. And in that article, it mentioned that you had a harder time initially starting out at Cedars. They didn't immediately welcome you with open arms. So can you talk to me a little bit about what that process was? You know, that was the only time I can honestly say that in my life I've felt prejudiced. But I think that made me stronger. You know, I had graduated on top of my class at County, mm -hmm. uh, USC, which was the second best program at the time. And uh, the director of our program had given me a letter that in 25 years, I was one of his top three residents who had wow. graduated the residency program. So I was on cloud nine coming mm -hmm. for, to my job interviews and I interviewed at Cedars in the Cedars Medical Group all day. Uh, and I went through five, six interviews, I think, if I remember correctly. At the end of the day, I got to the head physician mm -hmm. for the group. And as soon as I sat at his desk, he looked at me and he said, um, how was your day? I said, it was great. He said, what uh, religion are you? And I was like, oh, you know, I grew up with an atheist dad. So I didn't, right. I know nothing about religion. I still don't, honestly. Right. I've never been exposed. I grew up after, you know, during Iran with the revolution. I didn't want to know anything about God or yeah. after everything that happened to my country. Absolutely. So I was kind of taken back because it was the first time someone had asked me what my religion was. So I was kind of placed in this position. I had to say something. So I told him, I'm like, you know, I didn't grow up with, you know, much of anything but I guess you can say my parents were Muslims but they were really not Muslims because you know and as soon as I said that he said oh I just wanted to let you know that the position's taken uh and I was like what are you talking about he's like yeah yeah, yeah. we offered your position to someone yesterday and I was like well I've been interviewing all day what are you talking about right anyways I was so upset 
But one thing I have is pride. Yeah. And I always believed in myself. So I grabbed, he was holding my manila folder back then. There was no, you know, computers. In. Yeah. So I grabbed my folder out of his hand and it was this older gentleman. And I looked at him. I said, memorize my name because you're going to be sorry one day you didn't hire me. And I just slammed the door and I walked out. And I remember I went to the gas station. I was bawling my eyes out. I called my husband. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening to me in this country, you yeah. know. But I feel like, you know, on that that day, I told myself I'll never work for anyone. Yeah. So I came to Cedar sinai and I found the little tiny office and I went to the business office. I'm like, I want this office. They're like, we have an eight-year waiting list. I'm like, I don't care. I need a place in this building. Right. So long story short, I got the place. From that point, once you got your smaller office at Cedars, when did things transition to you being where you are now? How did you oh expand God. your clientele? Oh my God. It took 20, 20, maybe, I don't know, 18 years. Things don't just... Yeah come to you in life, (laughs) at least not for me. I've always worked for what I've earned Mm -hmm. in life. You know, when I started my office, it was just twice a week because I had no patients. I would see four patients a week in my office, but I would moonlight everywhere in town. Mm -hmm. And I used to do deliveries at uh, California Hospital. Back then, um, it was mostly, you know, uh, through Medi-Cal. So it was very little pay. So volume was important. So I started working for this clinic in downtown three times a week. And I used to do 80 deliveries a month by myself. And I would take call at California Hospital, two 24-hour shifts. So actually, I made a lot of money my first year because I was working like a crazy woman. Yeah. And we didn't have kids and I have the nicest husband on the planet. He used to drive me at night. Some nights I would do three deliveries in the middle of the night and I had a pillow and a blanket. And as soon as the beeper would go off, my husband and I would jump out of bed. We That's wouldn't even amazing. talk. We would both get in the car. He would drive <laughs> me. I would sleep in the car. You know, I would run up and it got to a point that I would have him time me. I'm like, time me. I'll be right back. I would zip up, do a delivery, <laughs> zip back down. And I'm like, how many minutes? He's like, 25. The next time, I'm like, how many minutes? He's like, today you were slow. It was like 45. (laughs) So that was our thing. Uh, And I did massive numbers of deliveries and I got really, really good. Yeah. So at that point, if someone my age was doing five deliveries a month, I was doing 85 deliveries a month. So it's experience. I always tell my children I was not the smartest person. Like, you know, there's some people who just get it. I was not one of those kids. I got to where I got in life through effort. Absolutely. So, you know, nothing was handed to me. But I, you know, when you do 80 deliveries a month, there's nothing you haven't seen. Right. And I did that for years. I think that's why I've done 8,000 deliveries. If you find, I don't know of a woman who's done as many deliveries as I have, honestly. I was I mean, a machine. I don't know what the standard is. I definitely no, don't know like those 10, statistics. 20. But that's <laughs> insane. That's yeah. truly crazy. So what would you say now? Like how often are you delivering Probably now 10. versus then? Now I do 10 and my back hurts and my head hurts <laughs> and my shoulders cramp and my toes cramp. <laughs> Times are changing. Once you got to that point, at what point did you start getting your high profile clientele? Was it through friends or connections? Not or? at all. In my life to this day, I don't have a single doctor that refers to me. I grew from my patients referring other patients. Right. One thing I believe in life is either don't do something or if you do it, you have to be the best at it. And I think that's what I did. I realized that there are a lot of smart people on this planet, but, you know, no one has my level of effort. So by doing a lot of everything, I got really good at what I was doing. There's not a single patient that comes to my office and doesn't get the right diagnosis. Even if I don't know what's going on with them. I know people who will help me diagnose them. I know rheumatologists and I know oncologists and I know hematologists and I know primary care doctors. So there's never, it's extremely rare. I can't honestly think of a single person that would walk into my office and not get diagnosed. And for me, it doesn't matter who you are. I know, you know, for people, it's important who I see. For me, I really don't care. Once you come into my office and you wear that pink robe, I don't care who you are. Yeah. I don't care if you make, uh, you know, ten dollars a month or if you make ten million dollars a month. Yeah. To me, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. And I think my patients appreciate that. 
A hundred percent. I think you're very well known for being a super compassionate doctor. And I think that a lot of press out there about you, obviously there's people who go straight towards your clientele and see certain names that are very well known. But I have a friend who goes to you and every time she sees you and I've ever asked for a recommendation or anyone else asks me if I know anyone good, you're always the first name because everyone has always made it so clear to me that when they see you, they could be the most famous person in the world or someone who's just scraping by and can barely afford to do it but just wants to see you because of your expertise and they leave feeling like you're going to remember them for the rest of your life and like they're your number one patient oh thank you you're so yeah. sweet i have so, to i want to add one thing you yes. have to love what you do a hundred percent you know i always tell my children on monday morning when people are dragging themselves out of bed I jump out of bed. When I walk into my office, I'm really happy. I did a post, I don't know, a couple of months ago, and I did a selfie, and I said, I love coming to work. And a friend of mine called me. She's like, that's not, you shouldn't make posts like that. <laughs> and I was just taken back, you know, because I'm like, but it's not a lie. Yeah. It was. It's really what I feel in my heart. And anytime you love what you do so much and you have so much passion, it the chance of failing is pretty low. Yeah. For sure. Like I said before, you're known for your compassion as a doctor. And I think one of the best examples of that has to be your journey with your daughter, Coco. So could you share that story with us and give us of more course. information? Of course. My favorite person on the planet next to my children and my husband. <laughs> um, so I love Coco. Uh, it was uh, at the peak of COVID when uh, Dr. Phil asked me to do a Zoom video on uh drug use in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So I was in my office and, uh, you know, you go on Dr. Phil, you know, they tell you, they present someone and then you have to comment about yeah. their case. And as they bring a uh, Teresa, Coco's mother on stage, she was so high, she couldn't even open her eyes. And it turned out she was 34 weeks pregnant, doing heroin and meth every two hours. She was mm -hmm. homeless. And her stepmom, her dad's new wife uh, basically filed, you know, for Dr. Phil to, you know, do something to help her. I texted the producer and I said, this woman's going to kill herself. She hasn't seen a doctor. I don't even know if her baby's alive the way she was high on the show. Right. So I asked them to send her to me. So they um, sent her to my office. She went to my bathroom for two hours and did heroin. And I was like, banging on the door. I'm like, you need to leave my office. This is not that kind of an office where you can come in and use drugs. But she was so high, she couldn't even, yeah, you know. Did, yeah. The nicest girl, by the way. The nicest girl with the nicest family. Yeah. So it was heartbreaking to see her. So finally, she came out of the bathroom. I did an ultrasound. Coco was doing well on ultrasound. And I told her that day, I really felt bad for her. I told her, if you promise me to stop your heroin and meth I'll switch you to methadone and I'll send you to the hospital to Cedars right now. And I promise to take care of you and deliver your baby safely. So she said, okay. She went to the hospital. It was a nightmare, even though we searched her everywhere. And we had a sitter sit with her and watch her not to do drugs. Right. After a week, her blood test tested positive for heroin. How? She was hiding it in her scrunchie, the only place oh I didn't search. God. I remember going back to the hospital. I slammed the door open and I said, get out of my hospital. You don't deserve what I'm doing. I've spent so many hours with you this week. Cedars was yelling at me because she didn't have insurance. They wanted right. her out. It was a nightmare. So that day I came home. She called me from the hospital and she said, if you, and she was on speaker and my oldest daughter was with me. And she said, if you kick me out of this hospital, I will die. I don't have anyone in this world. Give me another chance. And my yeah. daughter, she was, I don't know, 15 and a half, my oldest one at the time. She said, please, mommy, please, please. You have to give her another chance. Please give her another mm -hmm. chance. So I did. And she kept her promise. I switched her to methadone, put her in a homeless rehab. I would Uber her, you know, to my office. And finally, one day she ruptured her bag of water. She came to Cedars. I was on my way to deliver her vaginally. When my husband stopped me and he said, did you watch the entire Dr. Phil episode? I'm like, no, why? He's like, I don't know. I'm not a doctor, but this woman has a lot of pins in her pelvis. So I quickly searched the show and I start watching it and I see that she has like 12 pins in her pelvis, screws this big. Oh my God. I call her, I'm like, 
Teresa, did you have pelvic surgery? She's like, yeah, I forgot to tell you. I had a really bad accident. And my doctor said, I can never deliver vaginally. I'm like, at what point were you going to tell me that? Oh, my God. <laughs> so I took her to surgery, delivered Coco. And, you know, she went to ICU. And a week later, usually these babies go home, you know, uh, with the mom or to uh, rehab with their mom. But on a Friday afternoon, peak of COVID, I went to discharge Teresa and Coco. And as I went into her room, the DCFS social worker came in with me. And she said, we're here from DCFS. We're taking the child to foster care. And I don't know how much you guys know about foster care. It's really not it's good. Terrible. I had a social worker tell me 2% of foster parents are qualified to take care of children. Yeah. Anytime you hand money and give a baby with it, it's a recipe yes, for disaster. Literally a recipe for disaster. Anyway, so I got into a big argument with the social worker and I said, you are not allowed to touch this baby. I need to interview these foster parents. And she was looking at me like I was nuts. She's like, yeah. this baby's ours. We went back and forth and I got so frustrated. Finally, I said, can I foster this baby while you're, you know, while the mom is getting better? And she looked at me and said, yes. And I was like, wow. oh, wait, excuse me, what? You decide? <laughs> She's like, no, I don't decide, but I can tell you, you can take this baby home. So I didn't even know. I came inside in my car. I'm like, oh my God, I haven't even told my family. My husband doesn't know. So, and you know, here's Teresa begging me to take her child home. So I go home. It was Friday evening. I asked my husband to sit down. We're in our room. And I'm like, I did something today. He's like, what'd you do? I'm like, you know, there's going to be a baby. She'll come to our house for just two weeks. Right. And he looked at me, he's like, don't tell me you're bringing that drug addict's baby home. And I was like, you know, I've been with him like 30 years. He can read me like a book. He knows. He's been there through he's all been of your, there. everything. And I didn't even know what to say. So he got up, he went to the bathroom, he came back. He's like, I, you know, I know I'm so angry at the mom for what she did, but it's not the baby's fault. Yeah. Bring her. So on election day, four days later, we went and brought Coco home and that was now we're adopting her. You are officially? She's our, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that makes me so Oh, happy. yeah, yeah. That's amazing. She's the biggest gift that I've been, you know, I always wanted to adopt, but I've never, you know, envisioned this this happening. That's amazing. And how is she doing now? Is she healthy? Is she? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they she's told me she happy. wasn't going to walk in time. She wasn't going to talk in time. She wasn't going to do this and do that. And she was going to scream her head off and she was going to turn our lives upside down. Everything they predicted for her, the opposite has happened. That's and amazing. it's the power of love. 100%. I might not have a lot of things, but I have the most loving family on this planet Earth. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a beautiful story. Thank yeah. you for we sharing. We love her. We're going to move on to getting more into women's health issues like endometriosis, yes. polycystic ovarian syndrome. As an OBGYN, you specialize in helping treat PCOS, which stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. First off, can you just give a doctor's explanation of what PCOS is and what it looks like and how it affects people? Absolutely. So polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS affects 15% of women. I think it's higher, but generally speaking, it's 15% of women in the reproductive age. I call it the silent epidemic because these patients don't get diagnosed in time. And even when they get diagnosed, they don't get the right treatment. So mm -hmm. it's my mission in life to bring awareness to this condition. Uh, it's the top cause of infertility for women. And uh, these are patients who uh, have usually irregular periods. They have PCOS looking ovaries on ultrasound. People think polycystic means you need to have cysts on the ovary. It's no such thing. Mm -hmm. These are um, uh, larger sized ovaries with a lot of follicles. Right. So you don't have to have a cyst to get the diagnosis, but uh, there's a certain uh, look uh, on ultrasound of these ovaries that mm -hmm. in an experienced hand can be diagnosed very easily. These are also patients who have elevated testosterone symptoms, right. which could be acne, hair loss, facial hair, body hair, body acne. So you don't really need a blood test or an ultrasound to diagnose these patients. You can walk on the street. I can walk on the street and pick out PCOS patients. 70% of them are overweight, have weight issues. They usually have acne or they have male pattern hair loss. But because these patients don't get diagnosed, they don't get the treatment they need. You know, I always uh, tell my patients, if you're 25 and older and you have acne, that's not normal. Right. If you're older and your periods are completely irregular, that's not normal. 
if uh, you have male pattern hair loss as a young woman, that's not normal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but because they don't get diagnosed, they don't know how to get treated and they don't know what the cause of it is. One of the other associations with PCOS is a mood disorder. A lot of these patients sit on the spectrum of anxiety and depression and they have mood disorders. If you look at their history, they're anxious, they're depressed, or they're already on some kind of anti-anxiety or antidepressant. Because anytime you have a mood disorder, and you have um, issues with losing weight, that's a perfect recipe for an eating disorder. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Why do you think PCOS is so commonly misdiagnosed or not even diagnosed at all? To be honest, I think it's because it's a woman's issue. You know, same with endometriosis and PCOS. Both issues, endometriosis, it takes doctors, I don't know, nine to 11 years to diagnose it. PCOS, most patients don't even get diagnosed. I still have patients who come to me and they say, my doctor said, because my testosterone is normal, I don't have PCOS. Not true. It's not true. It's a clinical diagnosis. If you have a high testosterone, great. But if you don't have to have it, a lot of PCOS patients have normal blood test results. So, but I think it's a woman's issue. We get dismissed, you know, um, How many of these women go to the doctor and their doctor tells them just diet and exercise? No, diet and exercise doesn't work for these patients. You have to fix their hormone. You have to fix Mm -hmm. their insulin resistance. And once you fix that, their weight will go down, their acne will clear up, their periods will be regular, their hair loss stops, and they will not come to your office. But you just need to diagnose and treat them. So to answer your question, I think we get dismissed as women. If men had a condition, think about it, that was the top cause of infertility, Forget about acne and hair loss and weight gain and everything else that comes with it. Just if they had a condition that was the top cause of infertility, do you think they would get dismissed like this? Absolutely not. Yeah. What is the percentage of couples that are struggling with fertility? What is the percentage of it where it's actually the male who is the one who is struggling? Smaller. So I'll tell you, if you take 100 couples, regardless of age, Mm -hmm. and you have them go have sex three times a week, 50% of them will get pregnant in the first six months, Mm -hmm. 90% will get pregnant by a year, and 10% won't get pregnant. And a lot of those patients have endometriosis or a PCOS. Since I was a kid, I have had like insane body hair, facial hair, a mustache when I was four years old. I would try lasering it. Laser never works for me. It works for a little bit, but it always comes back. And then I started to notice having like hair loss on my head, but hair gain everywhere Everywhere else else. on my body. And Mm -hmm. it just didn't make sense. I noticed that certain areas of my skin had weird discoloration. And then I was diagnosed with PCOS. And luckily for me, it was found because the testosterone levels especially were very high. But it's just really crazy to think like how many people are actively struggling with that. So I do think it's just really incredible to have doctors like you and we need so many more who are able to diagnose PCOS and look for PCOS and help people get on a journey to treat it because it's it's unfortunate if you really don't know what it is and if you have a doctor who doesn't know you live a life where you're wondering why you have all these weird little things and you're not realizing that they're connected I actually never would have even now, like it's still, I'm still putting together like that my mood disorders could be actually related. could be very right. heavily related. And you know, I have to add before social media and Google and computers, women would really not get diagnosed. Yeah. But now at least, you know, with your podcast, with people talking about it, with, you know, they're starting to, they're starting to learn. Absolutely. There's a whole community of people with PCOS who post about things that are so unbelievably important and raise awareness. Like one woman posted what her face looks like if she goes three days without shaving it. And I was like, that's literally what my face looks like if I go three days without shaving it. Like to a T, that's exactly what I look like. And like, there's so many different things that address what are the daily struggles of living with PCOS. It's just crazy. Like luckily we're getting somewhere, but There needs to be so much more awareness. It's crazy. You know, I always say what I tell my girls, and that's why my oldest daughter wants to be the president of this country one day. I think it's because of all (laughs) the stuff I say at home. But I think women need to start taking positions of power. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one position at a time and the world will be a better place. It really will. And until we do that, our voices are not heard. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fact. 
So what are some of the treatments that you usually give to your patients when they're... With PCOS? Yeah. It depends if they're insulin resistant or not, you know, if they have the weight issue or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but with the irregular periods, if it's testosterone, you can do a combination birth control pill to level their testosterone. If their acne is really bad, you can add spironolactone for their acne. Mm-hmm. If they have insulin resistant component of it, you can give them metformin because it's that high insulin that stimulates right. the ovaries to secrete testosterone. So by lowering the insulin, you lower the testosterone from the ovaries and the right. periods become regular. So every patient's different. You have to look at the patient as a whole. Mm -hmm. Not every single patient is the same. You just uh, try to manage their symptoms. For me, the most important thing, I always tell my patients, I can fix everything you have except one. And that's the egg quality and count. So as we know, PCOS patients tend to have a lot of eggs but the quality declines super fast. Um, So if you uh, know that you have PCOS, then egg freezing is a must. So that's one of the first conversations I have with my PCOS patients. Because these are patients who go to their doctor, they, you know, do an ultrasound, they're like, don't worry about it, you have so many eggs, you have twice the number of eggs as someone your age. Right. Well, that's a red flag. You better freeze it because the quality, if you have that many eggs, the quality is probably low. Right. And because they don't get that information, by the time they're ready to have a baby, they're in their late 30s yeah. and then the quality is too bad. Absolutely. And you don't want them to get into that place. Yeah. So you say PCOS is the number one cause of infertility. Is that meaning there's no going back or is that people who are struggling to have children and they're not able to get pregnant and then they come to you or to another doctor find out they have PCOS and then is it something they can treat to then be able to get pregnant or is it usually too far gone at that point not at all we can absolutely fix it but age makes a difference if you have a 40 year old show up with PCOS who's just starting to get pregnant I get very concerned I pretty much say hi and I send him to a fertility doctor because I'm gonna go do IVF or try for six months and then let's go because of the quality it's a quality issue right but if you Mm -hmm. have a young girl who shows up and has had a patient uh, a couple of days ago when she doesn't take birth control she doesn't get her period she's overweight she's insulin resistant i can easily have that patient uh, start ovulating by putting her on a on a medication regimen and you make them you know ovulate and they get pregnant but a lot of them because they don't get the care they need they end up in the hands of fertility doctors and they get offered these expensive procedures and ivfs and this and that and a lot of them can't afford it i always say when you're young and broke you have good eggs when you're old and rich and you can afford egg <laughs> you freezing your eggs are no good so um one of my missions in life is to get egg freezing approved hopefully by insurances yeah. why do you think it's only covered by these tech companies i mean it's, it's getting a little better but they have the money it's expensive yeah i mean an ivf cycle here in la could cost you about 10 to fifteen thousand. if you go to bay yeah. area You know, they charged my sister-in-law $35,000 a cycle. Think about it. Who can afford that? That's insane. Who can afford that? And then you also don't know what you're going to get from that cycle. You could only get enough to have four and one of every five is a good egg. It's not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee. So it's only for privileged uh, women, which is really unfair, really, really unfair. So I always encourage women, you know, with PCOS and endo, if they don't have money, I'm like, let's go, let's get pregnant. You don't have time to wait, Yeah. you know, and if you have money, then you better freeze it when you're young. Right. A hundred percent. Okay. I feel like that's a good way to transition into endometriosis. Can you do the same as you did for PCOS and just give an overall explanation as to what endometriosis is and how it affects people? I I would love to. So endometriosis affects 10% of women. Like if you look at the studies, Mm -hmm. I don't agree with it. I think it's a lot higher. Once again, I think the percentage is low because women don't get diagnosed. Endometriosis is tricky because there's no blood test for it and there's not necessarily an ultrasound or MRI finding for it unless the case is a little bit more advanced. It affects in general 10% of women. And basically these are women who present with Uh, painful periods, right? And you don't really need to have any other symptoms. But some have painful periods, painful sex, bloating, uh, recurrent UTIs, Mm -hmm. chronic pelvic pain. Um, It's very nonspecific, but if I could describe endometriosis in one word, I would say pelvic pain, right? So it's the top cause of pelvic pain. Yet, 
women don't get diagnosed. So if I'm telling you that the top cause, the most common cause of chronic pelvic pain in a woman is endometriosis, how is it that it takes nine to 11 years for these women to get diagnosed? Why is it that the average age of diagnosis is 32? Right. You know, I mean, I get I really have to like calm myself down when, because yeah. I see all the endo patients and PCOS patients in this town. Yeah. And when I hear these stories, I sometimes have to take a deep breath because these are new patients and they don't know me and they don't know what I <laughs> feel in my heart. And I have to yeah. calm myself down so I don't just start twitching in the room as they're telling me their stories. But again, if you had a condition that would give men pelvic pain once a month, once a month, and it was their top cause of infertility. Right. Right? It's up there with PCOS. Yeah. Do you think they would get dismissed? No. I have 25-year-olds show up to my office from reputable OBGYNs in town with a Percocet prescription. Percocet. Do you know how many endometriosis patients get addicted to narcotics? Wow. It's not by choice. When you're in pain two, three, four, five days out of the month and you can't go to work and you have to change your social schedule and you have to plan your trips around your periods. Right. Wouldn't you pop that Vicodin in for pain? Yeah, but doesn't that also show like the level of pain? Like yes. To, to be prescribed, if a doctor is prescribing you that for your periods, wouldn't the doctor typically think like, something's not right here. I shouldn't have to like Advil, Excedrin, those kinds of things should work to alleviate that pain. And so if it's to that level that a doctor is comfortable prescribing an opioid, wouldn't you think that the doctor would rather run more tests or send someone to a specialist? But see, that's the problem. There's no tests to run. Right. You have to listen to your patient. Yeah. And endometriosis patients are very tricky because uh, doctors don't have time. When I used to see 40, 45 patients a day, I had 10 minutes to spend Mm -hmm. with a patient. Endo patients take 45 minutes for me to describe to them what I need to do, how I need to suppress their pain. If I need to do laparoscopic surgery, you know, gold standard treatment is to remove it and suppress it, you know. And these patients, you know, there are some doctors in this country that diagnose endo, but then they're operating on their patients every single year. I had a patient come to me and she's like, I'm here for my 12th laparoscopy. What? And I'm like, what? She's like, it's my annual laparoscopy. Once a year, she goes to her doctor and she has surgery. I'm like, uh, you don't need that. You know, the reason you come back is because endometriosis. So let me tell you, going back to your question, endometriosis is when the cells from inside the uterus are outside of the uterus. Got it. Every month, our ovaries are trying to get us pregnant. They secrete estrogen where the lining inside the uterus gets thick and juicy, ready for pregnancy. And when we don't get pregnant, the lining comes out as a form of period. This happens month after month, year year after year. 10% of women have these cells from inside the uterus, outside of the uterus around the tubes and ovaries. So once a month when the ovary is secreting um, estrogen to stimulate the lining, the cells outside of the uterus get stimulated. And when we don't get pregnant and our lining breaks down and comes out, These cells break down and bleed, but they're bleeding outside of the uterus. Blood is an irritant. It causes a lot of pain. You're not supposed to have blood outside of your uterus. So your body sends inflammatory cells to clean up that blood. And that inflammatory process causes more bloating, more pain. And um, eventually you get inflammation causes scarring. These patients get scarring of their tubes. Their egg count goes down. The flow to their ovaries decrease. Their egg quality goes down. Mm -hmm. The the scarring causes chronic pelvic pain. They get painful sex. I have patients who can't even have sex and they still get dismissed. And when they go to get pregnant, they don't get pregnant because when the egg comes from the ovary, it needs to be grabbed by the tube where you know the egg meets the sperm inside the tube and once the embryos form it goes and implants into the uterus right when you have so much inflammation in the pelvis and inflammatory cells when the egg gets released the inflammatory cells attack it at least that's what we think right and the egg never makes it to the tube so that's one reason two the tubes can get scarred second reason 
third reason is the accounting quality goes down. Right. So there's so many reasons why these women don't get pregnant and they still get dismissed. I think the reason they get diagnosed at 32 is A, they want to get pregnant, they can't, so they go from doctor to doctor until someone diagnoses them right. or they never get diagnosed and they just do IVF and get pregnant or uh, chronic pelvic pain. You know, they they bounce from doctor to doctor. Sometimes these implants sit on the bladder and these patients get recurrent bladder infections. I have patients, they come that I've, I've had 12 bladder infections. No, you don't. Right. These are not bladder infections. All you have to ask them, are your periods painful? Yes. Yeah, yeah those are not bladder infections. Absolutely. So is surgery the most common form of treatment? Not necessarily. In mild cases, you can do hormonal suppression. So estrogen make these implants grow, progesterone slows it down. Mm -hmm. So you can treat it with a progesterone IUD, birth control, low dose birth control pills, um, you know, any form of hormonal suppression can usually right. help. But for patients with painful sex, bloating, and all these other symptoms, the fastest way to fix them, and remember, I get these patients when they've failed, everyone else right. has failed them. Yeah. So they're usually and more desperate to get mm -hmm. better. I'm really good at laparoscopic surgery. So that's another thing. You have to be a good surgeon. Right. Um, if you give a laparoscope to 100 OBGYNs and you tell them, go look for endometriosis, 40% of them will probably miss it. Yeah. And I see that's that all insane. the time. So you have to know how these implants look like. You have to know how to do laparoscopic surgery, which is very technical. Yeah. You know, a lot of times these implants, I did four cases yesterday. They sit on the ureter or on the bladder or uh, on the vessel. So you have to be a very good surgeon to be able to remove the implant without causing any damage. Right. Obviously, you don't want to get into the bladder. You don't want to cut someone's ureter. So that's another limiting factor. So if for doctors, especially gynecologists who feel not as confident with surgery, yeah. they sometimes dismiss these patients. So it's, it's a disaster. I don't know if I told you, but for my birthday this year, I told my husband and children, I don't want any gifts. I want a billboard on the 405 freeway. <laughs> you laugh, but it's my dream. No, I, I, make, I, I love it for you. You better take a selfie and send it to me. <laughs> and um, it's going to say, do not ignore your painful periods. Hashtag endometriosis. I think that that is so necessary. I have so many friends who are actually currently experiencing yeah. treatment for endo. Some of my friends yeah. just had surgery for it. I know a lot of people who have struggled with it and have been gaslit most of their lives for having yeah. bad period cramps. That's what it's dwindled down to. And it's like, oh, you just have really brutal periods. And a lot of us just suck that up and think it's normal. It's normal to be puking when you have your period no. because the pain is so bad. That's not normal. I love your generation. I see my daughters, you know, I feel mm -hmm. like women are becoming more educated. They're uh, finding their voice. Yeah. And it goes back to those positions of power. We need Absolutely. to take those. We need to take those spots and just bring awareness and stop dismissing women for what they feel. Totally. You know? I don't know if you watched um, Halsey's uh, interview with the doctors. Mm. I'm speaking about it because she spoke openly about it. Yeah. But she used to go on stage and drop on stage, pass wow. out. And when she presented to me, the first thing I told myself is, what is, what is she doing here? Like, I'm not a neurologist, right. you know? But as I always do, I started asking my GYN questions. Mm -hmm. So I was like, do you get painful periods? She's like, yes. I'm like, when you pass out on stage, are you on your period? She's like, yes. I'm oh like, my oh my God. You know, and the reason I use her as an example, here's a woman who can afford the best health care, the best doctors. She was dismissed for years. She yeah. had a miscarriage on stage once and they dismissed her. And she talks about this openly. That's yeah. why I'm sharing it. But if someone at, in her position with so much power mm -hmm. and so much access to good care gets dismissed, she was diagnosed with anxiety, panic attack, bloating, some random like recurrent UTI, all the symptoms. IBS is a good one up there, yeah. you know, and yet everyone dismisses the number one cause, which that, I don't know how to change that. That's welcome to my life. I don't know, but it's unbelievable. I'm starting with one billboard. Maybe I'll you should one do day it. I can do hundreds of billboards. You know, my daughter told me once, she's like, okay, mommy, so you put a billboard up there and now they diagnose themselves with endometriosis. Who's going to treat them? Yeah. Then what? Then I'm like, okay, I need a second billboard 
afterwards <laughs> saying, if you have endometriosis, if you think you have endometriosis, go freeze eggs. And then a third one, <laughs> once you freeze eggs, go on hormonal suppression. Just treat them. Just as treat them on the 405. On the 405. Here's your treatment. <laughs> if you need treatment for endo, just drive down the 405. <laughs> Free treatment. <laughs> That's amazing. I I guess my last question regarding this topic would be, how expensive is the surgery to treat endo? And is that something that insurance companies cover? It is absolutely covered by insurance. Okay. Well, 100%. That's Chronic pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, which is painful periods, dyspareunia, mm -hmm. painful sex, all of it are diagnoses that are covered by insurance. Okay. And um, the surgery is completely paid for. But it's important for these patients to go to an endometriosis specialist Absolutely. who operates. Otherwise, like I said, they're going to put a camera and they say you don't have it. Yep. Okay. So I want to ask you one more question about one more topic and then we're going to wrap up. Something that is very important to you besides PCOS and endo, especially as a women's health doctor, is breast cancer awareness. So what, if you're comfortable sharing, made you so passionate about it? And can you tell me more about what's missing in terms of breast cancer awareness and what needs to happen and oh. what people need to know? I was not passionate about cancer or breast cancer. I um, grew up in a family with no cancer. I've never been, I had never been exposed to any anyone with cancer yeah. around me except friends and maybe distant relatives. When I was 48, uh, I went for a mammogram and uh, they saw something in my left breast. The radiologist called me and they said, we want to do a biopsy. I said, great. They did a biopsy of it. It came back as a typical lobular hyperplasia, meaning Atypical cells, no cancer. Right. So usually what you do for that, you do an excisional biopsy, you remove that area, and you get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So I did that, uh, and they called me back. They're like, there's just more atypia, but there's no cancer. So they told me to go back and come, you know, go home and come back in six months. There's a formula, Tyrocusic, that calculates um, a woman's lifetime risk of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. I had done that for a long time for my patients, and... One day I was sitting in my office and the rep for the genetic test, my risk, uh, brought lunch for us. And I was talking, you know, we were just chit-chatting in my office and I told him, I'm like, you know, yeah, I don't like it. I went for my biopsy and it shows atypia. And he looked at me, he's like, have you calculated your lifetime risk? And I just, you know, I was taken back. I'm like, no, you're right. I don't know why I haven't done it for myself. Mm -hmm. So as he was sitting and we were eating our food, I went on the formula and I started punching in my height, my weight, when, at what age I had a baby, density of my breast, just basic questions about myself, family history, which was nothing. And I hit enter and this number popped out 37 to 50 percent. Oh, wow. And I looked at him. I'm like, no, 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 I did it wrong. I, you know, deleted, I re-logged in and I punched in my number once again, 37 to 50 percent. And I looked at him, I'm like, how could it be? Like, what? 37%? So I immediately called my friend, who's the head of breast cancer at Cedars. And I said, you know, you keep telling me I'm okay and go for six, come back in six months. This formula is saying I have a 37% chance of getting breast cancer. And she's like, no, don't worry about it. You know, you're healthy. You don't eat meat. You don't smoke. You've never done drugs. You're not overweight. You don't have any family history. Right. You're okay. So I called her back and made an appointment and I went and saw her and she said, you know, I wouldn't do it. My lifetime risk is higher than yours, blah, blah, blah. My mom had cancer. I'm not doing a double mastectomy. It's crazy. And I looked at her. I'm like, no, I have three little kids. I don't care about my breasts. I already had implants. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to get breast cancer. Take right. these off and replace my implants and let me go live my life. Right. She's like, no, you're 48. That's so aggressive. We don't do that. Come back at age 50. I went back to my office, talked to my husband, and I was like, you know, when I'm, I'm very stubborn. When I want something, I want yeah. it. So I started interviewing different doctors, and no one wanted to do it for me. They called me crazy. They're like, you're paranoid. My friends called me crazy. Finally, I found this doctor at St. John's who was willing to do it for me. She was not comfortable doing it, but she was willing to do it. Right. But so many people called me crazy that I pulled one of these, I asked a camera guy to follow me. So I videotaped everything and I have my surgeon on video the day before my mastectomy who's trying to convince me not to have my surgery. And I said, why? And she looked at me. She's like, you know what she said? We have really good treatment for breast cancer. You know what that is? That's chemo. Yeah. 
and a, a risk. And at that moment in my heart, I'm like, these people are not on the same page as I am. I respect how they think, but that's not me. That's not what I want. I want my double mastectomy. So I did my double mastectomy. It was a nightmare. I haven't shared this with anyone on this planet, but I was under surgery for 10 hours. I bled out. Oh my my hemoglobin, a normal hemoglobin is 12. My hemoglobin post-op was five. I was so sick that I don't remember all this. Right. But apparently a friend of mine calls, she's an ENT, Dr. Nasseri, calls to check on me. And my husband said, I don't know, her blood pressure is like 50 over 20. And every time she sits up, she has excruciating pain. <sighs> she's like, what? So she calls a hematologist from St. John's. All I remember is this guy op- slamming the door open and starting yelling at the nurse. So he transfused me and my memory comes back. All Everything I remember is after my blood transfusion. And he told me the fact that I didn't die under anesthesia was more of a miracle than anything else that happened after that. Right. But long story short, I got called day two. I, on the day I was getting blood transfusion, my patient goes into labor four weeks early, screaming her head off why I'm not there to deliver oh, her. Oh. <laughs> so I went from... St. John's with four drains coming out of my chest filled with blood with a hemoglobin of seven to Cedar sinai and delivered a baby. Why? I didn't really deliver. I stood between the legs and the midwife delivered and I put my hands over Oh my goodness. I literally went from St. John's to Cedars and then I went to my bed and just passed out. On camera at St. John's when I opened my eyes, I tell my husband, I don't remember, it's on video, that's how I know it. I tell him, go tell the girls that mommy will never come home telling them she has breast cancer. And that's the first thing I say. And I keep saying, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. That's all I say when I wake up from anesthesia. Yeah. Um, A week later, I was leaving Staples for summer, you know, back to school shopping with my husband in the car on Mm -hmm. 405. I do everything on 405. (laughs) (laughs) That's where everything gets done. (laughs) And my plastic surgeon who did my reconstructive surgery uh, called me. And I picked up the phone and he said, Thais, I just got off the phone with a pathologist. The only time a pathologist calls a doctor is when there's cancer because no, they never call right. us. As soon as he said that, I just shut down completely. And I remember asking him, do I have cancer? I wouldn't even let him talk. I'm like, do I have cancer? And he said, yes. And I just shut down. And I didn't remember. I mean, my husband has me on the phone just bawling my eyes out because you know I fought for a year to get my double mastectomy right and everyone called me crazy so even I was shocked you know a week later when they told me I had cancer and all this time they were digging in my left breast guess where my cancer was the other one Mm -hmm. the right six o'clock right breast and um I was so confused I was so angry the only feeling I remember was anger I was so angry at everyone around me and I'm not an angry person because I begged them for this surgery. And I wasn't even stage zero, I was stage one, but back then they didn't know. All I could hear was you have three lesion, lesion one is this, and you know, you just shut down. When someone tells you you have cancer, you go, yeah. your brain goes to the cemetery. It doesn't matter. I'm like, I'm dying. I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. That's all I could, you know, right. hear in my brain. So I um, had an appointment uh, with Dr. Giuliano, the only doctor I had not seen at Cedars. He's the god of breast cancer surgery in the world. Right. So res- well respected. I had an appointment with him on a Monday, two weeks after my first double mastectomy. So on that Friday, I was looking at myself in the mirror. My breast looked great, but I <laughs> looked like I had an augmentation. Right. I called my husband. I'm like, I think they didn't take all my breast tissue out. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you know, when you do a double mastectomy, I'm a gynecologist. I've seen mastectomy all my life. Right. I'm like, I could, I was so full. And I was like, I think this is all breast tissue here. He's like, are you sure? I'm like, I want to go do an MRI. Meanwhile, I have my drains draining my chest still. I schedule my MRI, I go into an MRI machine. And the same radiologist who called me crazy the day before my surgery for doing a double mastectomy shows up puts my films up and puts my old films up. And she's like, oh, you did a double mastectomy. They did a great job. There's no breast tissue left. I kept saying, but I feel breast tissue. She's like, no, this is the cleanest mastectomy. And I looked at her. I'm like, I'm sorry, but you also missed my cancer. So you can understand how um, I don't, I lost the trust I had in this health system. I want to get a second opinion. She's like, no problem. Burns the disc. I take it to another facility. The head of MRI reads it and he tells me in 12 years, this is the cleanest double mastectomy he's seen. I'm like, great, 
fantastic. Yeah. My husband's like, you know, you're driving yourself crazy. It's a Friday afternoon. Let's go home. I go home. I had a great weekend with my family. On Monday, I go to see Dr. Giuliano. Uh, I was sitting, you know, on the exam table. Doors open. He comes in. He's like, Thais, I'm so sorry for your MRI result. And I sit up and I'm like, why? He said, all that breast tissue they left behind. I'm like, at this point, I start bawling my eyes out. I had nothing left in me anymore, yeah. you know? He takes me to a third radiologist who's who basically looked at my images and said, you have breast tissue here, 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 here. All the places that I could feel on my breast. Right. I came back to the room. I looked at Juliana and I said, I want another double mastectomy. He said, you're nuts. You almost died with the other one. I'm like, no, I signed a consent for double mastectomy. I told you I don't want to go in these freaking machines every six months. I don't trust yeah. anyone. I want to take the error out of all of this, you know, for my future. I right. want a second double mastectomy. He said, you're crazy. I'll do it, but you need to wait six weeks. So I waited six weeks. Six weeks after my first double mastectomy, I did a second double mastectomy. And um, it took six hours. I got two more units of blood transfusion. Um, I got a necrotic skin because when you operate twice on a skin that's not vascularized, right. I had black, like my skin was discolor. They told me I was going to lose my nipple. I went into oxygen chambers, hyperbaric oxygen chambers, two 90-minute sessions a day for 10 days until I lost my wow. vision pretty much from oxygen toxicity. Oh it God. was a nightmare, but I saved my skin and then my vision came back. Long story short, nightmare. My first surgeon had left 35% of my breast tissue behind. That's unbelievable. And then two people told you it was perfect Yeah. after that. So I have a breast cancer documentary that comes out hopefully this October. That's amazing. That will talk about, you know, I'm not even talking about my dub second double mastectomy because I don't want to put the fear of God in patients. Of course. Because that's not the point of my story. I just feel like I had bad luck, which is fine. This doesn't happen. There are many amazing surgeons that do really good work. Right. Like Dr. Giuliano, amazing. He always does good work. But um, the reality of it is my dream is to have every single woman on the planet calculate their lifetime risk yeah. and know the options of what to do with it. If you have a high lifetime risk, you don't need to do a double mastectomy. There's a pill called tamoxifen that you can take for five years and you can reduce your lifetime risk by 50%. At least five gynecologists walked up to me at some point during my recovery and they said, we heard about your story. How did you calculate your lifetime risk? Yeah. So if you're asking me, you're not doing it for your patients. Right. So I realized very quickly that I need to take doctors out of the equation with all due respect and empower women to sit behind a computer. It takes two minutes. You don't need any degree to just right. calculate your lifetime risk. You just plug in numbers and your family history, yes and no questions, yeah. and it spits out a number. This documentary, I think it'll save millions of lives. A thousand millions percent. and millions and millions of lives. Mm -hmm. Once again, I'm gonna end everything with this. If men would have breast cancer, do you think their lifetime risk would not get calculated? Absolutely not. So it's hard. It's hard to be a guy. It's hard to be in my position yeah. because I know so much, but I'm only one doctor. My reach is my patients who show up to my office. Right. Now with social media, maybe I have a little bit of a bigger reach, you know? Yeah. But um, the reality of it is I want to go out there and just scream. Look at what we've talked about in the yeah. past hour. PCOS dismissed, endometriosis dismissed, breast cancer dismissed. Yep. And the list goes on and on and on. Yeah, the, there's so many more I could have asked you about. It's yeah. insane. But I guess that brings me to my final point, which is just also for my listeners, where you can start and not let the health system fail you or lack of information fail you is to truly just listen to your body. Like if something doesn't feel right, don't give up on that. Believe in yourself. Believe what feels right for you because that's the only thing that we have the power to control. If something doesn't feel right, you have the freedom to call a doctor. And if you don't like what that doctor says or you still have that internal thought that they're not right, go to another doctor and don't stop until you really feel like you've been given the peace that you're looking for in doing so. So 
I guess just for me and for everyone listening, thank you oh, for sharing pleasure. all this information and for my listeners specifically, just listen to your body. That's the one thing we can at least control. Right. And there's a lot of information on the internet. Yeah. Your generation has that privilege that I didn't. So take advantage. Go to reputable sources, not to just any random blog, but reputable sources. Mm -hmm. And you can pretty much Google anything right now. Yeah, absolutely. But thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Oh my God, I feel like I've talked so much. I appreciate it. Your head is spinning. It's okay. (laughs) No, I'm good. I have one more question for you and then we're going to be done. This is just a music question. So at the end of every episode, I try to bring music into my podcast. So we do a segment called Al Piece 3, where I ask my guests to tell me three songs that they like or that might relate to the episode. Oh, my God. So, I will let you do that for me. Okay. Well, how about this? What if you could play music while delivering a baby? What would you listen to <laughs> to get you excited to deliver the baby? Ooh, I don't know. Because my it's patients hard. play it. I love music in general. I listen to a lot of Spanish music, actually, French music. So yeah. Okay, yeah. we'll pull some stuff together. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. A. You are truly amazing. You're an inspiration to women and people around the world. It doesn't matter how you identify yourself. You have done so much for this world, for the healthcare system, and we're all just lucky to have you oh. as someone to look up to. So thank you for everything. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank That's you. That's amazing. I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much. Okay, we will see you all next week on Trying to Figure It Out. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode.